Okay, fantastic. So I'm going to introduce myself and talk a little bit about what's happening here in Totnes and then also about the transition movement across the world and then talk a little bit about One Year in Transition, which is the course that I run for young adults because we're addressing many of the issues that you're also looking at. Okay, so first of all, for myself, so I, uh, I live in Totnes in Devon. I used to live in London. I had a long career in the art world. I did things like I wrote for the Times as an art critic. I was an exhibitions curator. But in 2006, I think it was, I saw Al Gore's film An Inconvenient Truth. And I really woke up to all the issues that were coming together. And so I got really interested in climate change. I read a lot of stuff. I was living in London. I was very fortunate to be able to go to conferences and meetings where all this was being discussed. And I, of course, realized it wasn't just climate change that was the issue on the horizon. By the way, do I need to go more slowly to, for you to understand? Or? No, 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 it's, all right. it's okay. It's okay, good. Um, so then I realized there were other things going on, like um, huge population growth, um, species extinction, the way in which ecosystems are being destroyed, um, the way in which the economy was also likely to grind to a halt because we're coming to the end of renewable resources and non-renewable resources. So I saw there were many complex problems approaching. And of course, when these are systemic problems, all of them, and we don't know what happens when systemic problems collide. Like we don't know what the impact of climate change is really going to be on crop production, for instance, in different parts of the world. <clears throat> and so we're entering a period of huge complexity. And I began to get interested in um, what's called these wicked problems. Wicked problems are problems that are very difficult to solve. And they also have very kind of unpredictable outcomes. It's not like we can even potentially, with our human minds, just come up with a solution. And so I helped to set up Transition Highbury in North London, where I lived, in 2009. And this was one of the first transition groups in London. And the way we set this up was that um, there was a meeting in North London uh, where, where a lot of speakers came to talk about climate change, particularly in the city. And Rob Hopkins, who founded Transition Towns, about, um, I suppose, about 10 years ago in Ireland, <clears throat> where he, was <clears throat> he taught permaculture in Ireland. And he got his students to do something that he called an energy descent action plan, looking at the whole, um, all the life support systems in County Cork, where he was living in this particular town called Kinsale. And they kind of came up with this plan for how you would do low carbon food and low carbon transport and low carbon building and low carbon energy. And that was like the beginning of transition. So anyway, I came to it a little bit later and we began to think about how to um, encourage the people where I lived in the city of London, in this part of London called Highbury in North London, how we would really encourage them to get engaged in actions that would be um, promoting low carbon living. And we started by holding films, and we showed a lot of films that you may have seen, like, um, like The Power of Community, which is a great film about Cuba, mm -hmm. and how people in Cuba, when they had the sanctions, <laughs> and they didn't have any petrol coming into Cuba, were able to bring in permaculture. Have you seen The Power of Community? I have, yeah. I have seen it. Okay, this is a film about Cuba, how Cuba responded when it had almost no fossil fuels to work with in the time of sanctions. It's a great example of how they brought permaculture into the city. And they also saw well-being level levels go up and health improve because people had to exercise more, they had to ride bicycles, and they were eating healthier food that was grown locally. And there's another film that we showed called The End of Suburbia which is about America and how, particularly in America, but also, of course, in many places in the West, we have these huge suburbs around our cities. 
And the only way these suburbs function is because people have cars and they can drive about and they can go a long way to get their food from the supermarket and they hardly walk anywhere. But if there was no petrol or petrol became very scarce, these, the suburbs would not function. So we started to show these films. And in transition, after we show a film, we always have a discussion because some of the films can be quite shocking when people see these things for the first time. They often are very alarmed and frightened and they don't know how to respond. So we have discussions, maybe people in twos or threes turn to each other and say what they thought about the film, what were the pieces they found the most frightening, how they wanted to respond to that, and just to let the feelings out. So that's very important when we begin this work. We also think about people's feelings. And there's an important piece of transition called inner transition, which is allowing space for feelings, feelings to be talked about, but also to think about how we can become more resilient. So how do we deal with these feelings? And we say things like going out into nature, connecting to nature, having good friends around who you can share all these things with, um, maybe having a spiritual practice that you do every day that kind of grounds you, um, there are many different ways in which we can think about how personally inside ourselves we become more resilient because this is a huge task that we have ahead of us and we need to be really thinking of ourselves and taking care of ourselves so we can do it in the best possible way. So thinking of the food we're eating, the kind of news we're seeing, we don't have to see all the bad news, we can filter the news that's coming in while still being aware of what's happening in the world. All these things are important. So we, we, we did awareness raising in Highbury. And this went on for about a year. And then we held a really big event and we got speakers in and we had people speaking about clean energy, about growing food locally and what permaculture is. Um, we had people kind of telling us stories about um, how indigenous peoples um, survive without using very many resources. We showed a film. We even had our MP come to the meeting, who's now the man who's running to be leader of the Labour Party. So that's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. And we had this kind of big surge of energy. And it was very exciting. And we got people into groups and we said, well, OK, what can we do here? And we did a kind of world cafe. Have any of you done world cafe process? Yeah. Yeah, yeah fantastic. So we had about four or five tables as so we had one table looking at transport and one table looking at food and one table looking at energy and then a couple of other things. And we came up with all these things that we wanted to do. And so we thought, okay, this is fantastic. We're getting a lot of energetic and interested people here in Highbury. But then over the next few months, it kind of all dwindled away and we were left with a core group. And I heard one of you say kind of, how do we move beyond this core group of people who are very committed? How do we bring in more people? <clears throat> and then we, um, we scratched our heads for a while because we weren't sure what to do next. Um, but we got a couple of projects off the ground, um, particularly the food growing projects were the ones that were important because we, um, for instance, approached the local church and said, can we grow food in the churchyard? Or in, it was actually not the churchyard, it was more like the garden of the vicar next to the church. And he said yes, and one side of the churchyard was directly onto the street. And then we found another piece of land where we could grow food next to the doctor's surgery. And we did a whole food growing project there. We thought about foods for health and well-being and different kinds of herbs. And what often happens in, or what can happen in a transition group when it starts is that there's a huge surge of energy and then people sit around talking about projects, but they don't do very much. And that's the moment when people start to leave because they think, oh, nothing's happening here. And you know, what's the point of being part of this group? So we saw quite early on, it was important to make visible what we were doing. And food was a great way to make visible the whole message of transition. And if you like, what you're trying to do is think of gateways that people can step through food being a great gateway for people to start to engage with all these issues with. Because I suspect 
for all of us. It's kind of one thing that really wakes us up to the challenges ahead. And then we start to realize that everything's interconnected. But you have to take that first step through whichever doorway it is, whether it's around water or food or energy. Uh, and then I moved down to Tutnes about five years ago in 2010. And of course in Tutnes, the whole transition movement had been going for a lot longer. It's now in its ninth year in Tutnes. And Rob Hopkins moved from Ireland to Totnes about, I guess, about 11 years ago now. And he started to do the same thing that we had done in Highbury with a couple of friends. He started to show films to really wake people up to what was happening in the future. And Totnes is quite unusual. It's quite a small town. There are only about 9,000 people living here. And we are in a rural part of southwest England in a county called Devon. So you could say this is kind of normally regarded as rather a sleepy part of England. But Totnes, because it's a little market town, and traditionally people have always come to Totnes to sell things and to buy things, it's also it's like it's a hub, an exchange of information. And it has a very strong community spirit. So the whole transition initiative took off fairly quickly here because there were people who could really see the importance of taking actions around creating clean energy or building cheap local housing made of local materials or thinking about transport and how we take the carbon out of our transport system and create new bicycling paths, for instance. And so what's happened here in Totnes is that um, initiatives or kind of projects that grew up in the core group then gained their own identity and became separate enterprises. And for instance, we have something called Transition Homes. And Transition Homes is a group of people who have managed to buy some land on the edge of Totnes and are now building low-cost eco-houses. That's partly in response to climate change. It's partly in response to the fact that we don't have very much social housing here. That's low cost housing for people in need. And we are very aware that we need to respond to that need. And then there was another group which was a food growing group. And out of that came as a community supported agriculture project um, in an area that had been growing vegetables but had become um, disused. And we also have a new project called Grown in Totnes, which is all about looking at the gaps in our food supply. So we have a lot of dairy produce down here in the southwest because we have got very good grass. We've got lots of cows. And so we produce a lot of milk and cream and yogurt, but we don't grow any grain. We grow grain for cows and, and for sheep and so on, but we don't have grain for humans. And so now we're starting a project to grow oats locally. And we're beginning to think, well, what are the other gaps in our production? We also have got a project called Food Links, which is connecting up people who are growing food to people who would like to consume the food. But the people who are growing the food are often small producers, and it's hard for them to get their food to market. So it's like we're creating this market space in the middle to connect up the producers with the people who'd like to buy and eat the food. We also have an inner transition group. Um, interestingly, in Totnes, we've got a lot of psychologists and psychotherapists, and a lot of them are very interested in eco-psychology. That's, in a sense, that's really kind of, how do we make sense of what's happening in our world now and how humans are responding to that? And so we have people who, who meet on a regular basis to think about how they can support local people going through this period of of change, which is often quite scary and maybe quite difficult for people. So that has been going on over the last eight years. And we kind of look back over the last eight years and we say, OK, the first four years were really about raising awareness. The second four years were about getting those projects up and running and getting really strong. And of course, we've got energy projects too, which I haven't yet mentioned, but um, we have an organization called Totnes Renewable Energy Society, which has been doing community share offers, and people have been investing in projects in which they can, um, 
they can invest in kind of solar generation, they can invest in hydro generation and all these different things. So now we're in the period of the, the next four years and what we're doing more and more, having kind of been quite inward looking and thinking about, okay, we need to do all these things to really get our community resilient and thinking about the future. We're now beginning to say, well, let's kind of look outwards and let's see what's really needed in this town. And so things that we can see that are really needed are more spaces for young people to play, more opportunities for young adults to stay and find a livelihood here. We need more social housing, for sure. We need more care of elderly people. Um, so these are issues that we are now beginning to tackle. And the way that we're beginning to do that is not by kind of saying, we've got the answer. We would like to suggest we do this for you. We are hosting discussions. And so we have a, a project that's come out of Transition Town Totnes called Caring Town Totnes. And we have been looking very carefully about all the issues around well-being and health in our town. And we've convened conversations. So one of you said um, how to organize a space for people to meet and trust. So that's what we've been doing. We've been creating these spaces for people to meet and building trust between them. And for health, we've been getting people together from like the local doctor's surgeries, the local hospital, the local um, authority that's meant to be paying for um, the well-being of people with um, physical and mental health problems, for care of older people. Um, we're bringing together people who have run independent caring services and we're bringing them all into one space. And because we've been around for a while, we've built up trust with many different um, organizations and individuals. And the really interesting thing that happens is that we don't have an agenda ready for the meetings. We just bring people together to say, we realize there are real problems here. We'd like to put our heads together to see how to solve them. And people come away from those meetings feeling really excited because there are people there that they meet who they've heard about for a long time, but they've never had time to connect to. And new projects just kind of emerge very naturally from within that space. But we realized that if we hadn't done all those years of building connection and just staying um, present and active in what we're doing and really kind of just kind of repeating our message, that we wouldn't have built the trust and we wouldn't have been able to convene those conversations. So my reflection is that um, it's really important to think about your long-term ambition when you start a transition project or a transition group. Uh, it's very good to have conscious design in there from the very beginning and to think about what are the needs of this place and not just kind of how can we do low carbon growing food or low carbon energy, but to really kind of meet people where they are by understanding their issues. Because then once you kind of thought about, okay, well actually how can we do low carbon care of the elderly? Or how can we do low carbon social housing? Then you're really going to start to engage people about what they deeply care about. I think a lot of people are so busy working, uh, have so many worries in their lives, that they don't often have an opportunity to stand back and to think about the big issues that all of us are concerned about. And so the easiest way to start to engage them is just to have conversations with them and say, what's really important to you? You know, if we could help you change one thing in your life, what would it be? And then you start to think, well, okay, how can we kind of Think about well-being in connection to growing food and can we kind of work with our doctor's surgery and create a space where people who have physical or mental health problems can come and grow food with us. So it's being a bit clever and thinking about, well, how can we create a win-win situation here so that everybody feels really happy to be part of this project and we know they're going to be good results for people. Okay. Um, so transition, yes, it does bring everything together. Um, we do a lot of thinking around sharing economy. We um, have a whole project within transition called Reconomy, 
which is rethinking local economies. And within that, we think about social enterprise, but we also think about things like time banks and, um, and local economy trading schemes, let's which are essentially sharing economy schemes because no money changes hands in those. We realized that we need to um, work with money as well as build the kind of relationships in which we don't need to have a monetary exchange. But we know that you know both of these things have to happen at the same time. It's not either or. We have to work with both. Um, let me just think. So you talked about collective decision making, um, and I think that's super important because many transition groups form and get very excited and have lots of ideas to start with, and then they get really stuck on group process and collective decision making. So we see things like nonviolent communication and ways to make decisions like the sociocracy model. Have you studied sociocracy? Maybe some of you know about that. It's practiced in my living project also. Okay, yeah. great. So maybe you can share that with the others later. But sociocracy is um, a very good decision-making tool, which essentially says when conflict arises in a group, that's the wisdom of the group trying to show itself. And rather than being frightened of it and trying to push it to one side, you kind of go into it. Mm -hmm. And you talk about the objections that people have to a proposal and you keep going around in a circle until the objections are heard and then there's a vote on how to move forward. So um, as a very practical way for solving problems and making decisions, I, I recommend you look at sociocracy. So you also asked a question about um, convincing new people, especially young people, to get engaged. That's a really good question. I think you can't make people do anything, okay? That's a kind of essential first point to make. But you can get people curious. And so I think engaging people in dialogue or putting on events or just kind of making what you're doing really visible helps. Because just kind of getting people curious and then being prepared to get into conversations with people, have dialogue with people, again, kind of find out what they're really interested in but also get a chance to kind of talk about why you care so passionately about the future, that really starts to engage people because people really respond to people's passion. And deep down, everybody cares about their children, their grandchildren, what's going to happen in the future. But I agree it's not easy. And one of the things that we um, set up this program one year in transition for, which is for young adults who want to be social change agents um, is that we kind of start to think about storytelling and we on our first week when we meet up in September we work for one day with a really fantastic storyteller who tells us some really old myth stories um, some like Russian stories about Baba Yaga and Vasilisa or there may be stories about um, Prince Ivan and the Firebird stories from around the world and by thinking about human beings as storytellers and how we tell the story of the times we're living through and how we tell our own story, we're able to kind of get into a space where we can see that we're part of this kind of huge flow of history and that history has always been about these challenges and about how we rise to these challenges. <clears throat> and how we can kind of be the heroes and heroines of our own stories. And that gives us a little bit of kind of distance between our ambitions and the world as it is now. And I think that's quite important to kind of put that gap in, because otherwise we can get very um, caught up in what is happening on the immediate surface. And that's the way we all get burnt out. If we work too hard at changing things on the surface, but actually what we need to do is start to focus kind of what are the real undercurrents happening here? What's, what's not visible, but which is kind of like the tide of history that's moving along underneath us? And how do we connect into that? And um, what's happening at the moment, what I can kind of, kind of see from just looking around and reading the news is that there are many um, 
many kind of disasters happening and many things that are, are potentially very scary, you know, to do with violence and war and um, migration and climate change. So these are all things that are real and are happening, but they're happening on the surface. What's happening underneath the surface is this huge movement of people who really care, who are responding in so many different ways and are not necessarily connected up, but it's a very powerful movement for change, which is saying that human life is really um, sacred and important, and we need to work to um, further human life and the life of all living beings in whatever way we can, whether we're setting up um, a campaign in the Amazon to stop the rainforest being cut down, or whether we're in Totnes and we're thinking about social housing. These are all movements that share the same values. And so I think that when you go away from the meeting you've been having, um, that's a really important thing to bear in mind that all over the, the globe there are people who are really caring, who are really doing fantastic work, and that you're not alone. You can always find these people if you look around for them. And it's really important for you all to stay connected, I think, because you can kind of share each other's challenges and triumphs and difficulties and moments when you feel you just can't do it anymore. So that's important to have a group around you who's going to support you and keep going. But also just kind of really have this awareness about what's happening underneath the surface and how there is this um, movement that's underneath the radar is not happening at gov government level so much as at grassroots level. And that's where change is going to come from. Okay, well, I think I've probably um, talked enough, but I would love to answer any questions that you might have. Can I start? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just speak a bit if you okay. So I was interested in how to find a common space for people to meet and to build trust. Like, do you go to the government or is it like a private home or what is preferred? So when you're thinking, have you got a particular community in mind that you're thinking of? No, just if there's some initiative and you need some place to meet and also to invite new people. Like, what what place are you, should you look for? So you look for a place that um, is kind of a neutral space? Yes. And you look for a space that is a community space? So when we did our first meeting in Highbury in North London for transition, we had a space that was a kind of um, like an ecological site in our urban setting. There was one space where they were experimenting with having a wind turbine and they had like a classroom and a nature area for school children. So we hired the classroom for the day and we invited people to come there. And we put the invite out through lots of different ways in which the community could see it. So we put notices in the shops. We sent things out in newsletters, we involved our local churches, we put um, signs up in the doctor's surgery. We thought about all the places where our community would meet. Like you can put up notices at bus stops, you can do all sorts of things like that. Um, we didn't do it in a church hall because we felt that kind of already had a particular slant to it, like it was already kind of going into the realm of religion, and we wanted to kind of keep it a bit more neutral than that. But it's a possibility that if you had a church that was very friendly, you could use a church hall. So it's important, it's like an open space, a space that is already a community space, it's not a private space. And, and then the, um, the important thing is how you word the invitation. So you kind of word it in such a way that it gets people really curious and interested you don't have to say all the things you're going to do there. But people love the idea of meeting people in community. And one of the things that we're realizing in transition is that people really miss that sense of being in community. And so a lot of people find that the, the greatest pleasure they get out of being in transition and doing projects is a sense of being in community and having other people around them. So that invitation to kind of become part of a new movement within the community, I think, would be very attractive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and uh, Isabel, uh, I was wondering what are uh, examples of projects that are arising from one year in transition of from the young people who spend this one year with you developing their their ideas? Like, can you give us a couple examples, maybe? Yes, sure. I can give you about three examples. So one um, one young man called Rupert who has just finished the course with us is setting up a community bakery in Wales and he's um, baking bread for the local community using a traditional uh, wood-fired oven and he's also growing the grain that he needs for his bread locally as well. He is um, involving the community in the sense that people commit to having a loaf from him every week. He's setting the whole organization up as a cooperative and he's also doing um, learning projects for local school children. And he has a pizza oven, which is also wood fired on the back of a trailer that he takes around to festivals. So he's also, apart from growing bread and making great pizzas and growing his corn and his, um, his rye and so on, he's also wanting to connect people to the land and understand how food comes directly from the land where we live. Another project uh, led by a young woman called Hannah is to um, create a kind of an enterprise which is about making um, video films for non-governmental organizations which helps them to tell their stories better. So she's very much into whole, the whole business of kind of how do we tell our stories better and how do we get them out there. So she's done great crowdfunding campaigns for people She's making a video for one year in transition as well. Um, she's really thinking about, you know, big corporations have a lot of money to spend on marketing and publicity, and small NGOs don't have a lot of funding. But it's really important that the message is heard and that it's really kind of lively and amusing and engaging and serious at the same time. Another young man called Robert. Um, is also interested in storytelling. It's quite interesting actually. A lot of people on the course get really interested in storytelling because as human beings we are storytellers. That's how we kind of live our lives and exchange our experiences. So anyway, he's working also kind of with um, big organizations to help them tell their stories better. And he comes on our courses and he does storytelling workshops with us. Uh, another young woman called Haley has um, been helping out on a community project in Manchester in Moss Side, which was um, a small urban growing project in the middle of this very, very urban piece of Manchester. And she's found her, her calling to become a forest school teacher, and she's begun her training to be to do that forest school teaching and she just got her first job as a forest school teacher. So through One Year in Transition, which is when young adults bring an idea for a project they want to do in community, that they want to turn into a livelihood for them, that they can earn money from, they arrive at the beginning of the year often with not very much idea about how it's going to work out. And we take them through this whole process of helping them understand the community that they're in, because they'll be in a geographical place, community. Um, we help them get clear about their goals. We help them see how it's important to respond to the need in that community. And then we help them find people who have got, like kind of um, people who are already doing the work that they would like to do. And we get them work experience placements with those people. And through the year, we just keep on going back and back over what does it mean to kind of map ourselves into community? And we do this in so many different ways that by the end of the year, you've got a very strong sense of who I am in this community and what I have to offer and how I can talk about what I'm offering. Thank you, that sounds really, really amazing. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you have a question as well? Yeah, oh, do you hear me well? Come a bit closer if you can. I don't uh, know if that's possible. I, I will just come here. I will come here. Ah, no, 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 don't move it. I will just, okay. I yeah. will just speak from here. 
I wanted to a little bit continue the question uh, of Melanie because she told, she asked you about the place and I mean if I will find a place like this what's in your opinion the best idea to gather people around I mean for the community like this to create the community is like uh, when I have like very close people and everybody has his own garden but they don't speak at all what in your opinion is the best way to gather these people around uh, one project or uh, something because uh, i really wanted to think about this and uh, I, I i think that you're a perfect person to ask <laughs> so okay well one thing you could do is just have a tea party you could just invite everybody to a tea party and say we're all doing the same thing let's all meet up because I think what you're doing is really great. And I would love to think about how we could do something collectively. Maybe we could have a kind of giant project just to get people into a really nice space and for them to meet each other is often just the first step. I don't think you have to think too much about how it's going to pan out, how what the result's going to be. You've got to kind of trust that you can hold the space and be the hostess and then and allow great conversations to happen. And what you can do when people arrive is that you can maybe have three really interesting questions, like kind of, if we all got together, how would this community be happier? Or how can we share the different experiences that we have of growing? And then with these three questions, you can get people into groups and start talking about them. And then have a piece of paper on the wall, a big piece of paper, and then write down all the things that people are thinking. So you probably know that all sorts of ways in which you can get people engaged around conversations. So you can either have kind of one-to-one -one conversations or conversations in groups of about five people and make sure people are writing down their ideas and maybe they put them on little sticky pieces of paper and put them up on the wall or you can kind of just have a big piece of paper and someone writing. But I think you could work all that bit out. The most important thing is just for you to find a space and to put, put the invitation out. Thank you. Yeah, maybe. I mean, it's very specific because we have like very close people there which, uh, and we don't meet each other, so... <laughs> Yeah, so I, I I was just telling that we are in my city. We have this specific neighborhood when everybody has its suburbs, of course. So we have yes. like, everybody has his own garden, and he doesn't go out only just maybe for a show. But but we don't have really a public space, you know. So this is a little bit difficult, and I think that people are close because they go back from the work and they just stay in their houses and. They, I yes. actually, I was living in a block of flats with 13 floors and I knew everybody and then I moved and I know like uh, only my close neighbors and I think it's very sad. So uh, that's, that's why my, my question uh, about the idea which can gather people around. So thank you. No, that's great. Um, we've got an initiative here called Transition Streets and Transition Streets is like a program of um, people on a couple of streets that live near each other that get together every month and have a conversation. Like one month the conversation is about food, one month is about where we do our shopping, another month it's about energy, another month it's about how we save water, another month it's about waste, for instance. And when I first moved to Totnes, I, I created this kind of leaflet um, and said, do you want to be part of a transition streets group and have these conversations? and you can meet at my house and for the first meeting. And I just printed off all these letters and I went around all my um, neighbors, who I didn't know, obviously, because I just arrived. So I put an, an invitation through each letterbox and I said, you know, meet, come to this place at this time on this day and let's have our first conversation. And also, of course, I put why this is important. It's all about kind of issues to do with how do we respond to climate change and all the challenges we're facing ahead. And I got about 10 people coming to the first meeting. And then after that, we met in different people's houses and we went through this whole series of different conversations. And the conversations are still going five years later, which is amazing. Yeah, there are still great. people in that group who meet up. And they say the best thing that happened is that it took a complete stranger to come along and to connect them up because they'd never talked to each other. These are people who'd lived nearby to each other for years and years and years, but they'd never actually sat down and had a conversation. 
So what <laughs> makes that uh, people come back to the meeting? Like they return next for the next. They meeting. return because they realize they've got shared concerns and shared values, and they love the sense of having community around them. Because so many people in cities live lives that are very separate and disconnected. They don't know their neighbors, and it often they don't really may have a reason to know their neighbors unless they get cross with them because something is happening that they're not happy about. But to have a positive reason to meet is something that's kind of many people will respond to. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to ask about the storytelling, if you could explain a little bit more how it works or what what a storytelling session is about or... Yeah, sure. I'm sure you've got great storytellers somewhere in your community who you may not have found yet, but there'll be someone who's kind of known as being a storyteller. So storytellers um, traditionally tell the old stories. They tell the stories, you know, from from long, long ago, like the fairy stories that our grandmothers told us. And hearing those stories as an adult is a very different kind of experience because you see that all of human nature is contained in those stories. Like all the dilemmas we're facing today, all the, um, all the psychological makeup of human beings is in those stories. And so we can read them as like kind of almost like metaphors or um, how can one say it is kind of like um, dramas if you like but they're the same dramas we're playing out today so a good story storyteller will be very aware of that and they'll tell their stories in such a way that um, they can see the relationship between the very old story and the world we're living in and they will give that kind of space within which you can begin to discuss, well, how does this story really affect me? Like if I hear the story of um, Prince Ivan and the firebird and how he goes into the forest on his horse and he sees the, the golden red feather of the firebird on the, on the path in front of him and his horse says, don't pick up, don't pick up the feather because there'll be trouble ahead if you do, but Ivan decides to pick up the feather and then he goes into all these amazing adventures. So you can see that as a kind of, okay, when have I picked up the feather of the firebird and how has it got me into all these adventures and, and what is the kind of, um, what is the energy I've had to summon up in myself in order to be able to overcome all the challenges ahead. And when you start to think in that way, you can see that your life is part of the lives of humanity that's been going on for centuries and that the dramas we're facing now as human beings they may be new in the sense that they're very big because we have this global awareness now through the internet and communication. But they're in many ways are the same dramas. We're still up against human nature. You know, people's greed, people's stupidity, people's fear overcome them is often the theme of many of these stories. And then how do we allow magic to happen in our lives as well? question from Amelia, if you can see me. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, right. Uh, so I would like to come back maybe a bit to what um, Agnieszka asked before. Uh, she was telling about her neighborhood and I'm living in a rather different setting. Um, it's a neighborhood which is very, very connected already. It's, uh, it was previously uh, like a worker's neighborhood, so they were all families Who's, uh, in which fathers worked at the coal mine, which was just next to us. Now it's, uh, it's presently a museum, so it's nice. But um, but it's still like it still has this really strong uh, sense of community, which is amazing. But the like the maybe the problem you can see obviously is that uh, the whole sense of community is directly connected to coal. And, yeah. and also because it's old housing, it's still everything is heated by coal, um, mm. and uh, uh, so <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so like how to how to approach this kind of this kind of situation, and uh, it's it's the mm. thing that has been really bothering me for a long time um, because I'm also living in a region which 
which basically has the history of coal and like this is this is the the thing that people gathered around and up until now it still is the, the the identity of the region is very much this so there is a question of how to communicate things how to come with uh, those important questions in a setting like this how to how to how to come with it my, my idea was just to come from the from the like more lower scale questions like would you like to grow food together would you like to maybe work on the heating or maybe like installations of the windows like something very very uh, maybe low tech and very simple but which can also transmits the the idea of of like maybe community around things that are important um, yeah more like green stuff more like this instead of uh, okay let's just have a barbecue and maybe you know uh, so, so yes, that was, that's my question. Very good question. Okay, so um, I've been working with a community up in Scotland, which is also an old coal-producing region in west of Glasgow. And um, although it was uh, very much producing coal up till about 50 years ago, the coal mining then stopped and it became a very green region. The people went back there who had been the children and grandchildren and the coal miners. So it still has that kind of culture within it. But because there was a plan to do um, coal bed methane extraction there, people got very concerned about the health of themselves and their children. And the issues around health have been the kind of way in for that community mm -hmm. to reimagine its future. Yeah. Its future is a much kind of cleaner, greener place. I think that meeting people where they are, kind of really finding out what concerns parents and grandparents in your area mm -hmm. about the future of the children and the grandchildren would be a good place to start. Because I'm sure there must be concerns about health.